and get to better things, which is actually the books that we're looking at. Who cares uh, how I feel about the books per se? Let, I'd rather, and uh, again, this is my, uh, I actually think it's what Lewis tries to do in his own um, work as a literary scholar as well as he tries to bring the reader to read the books and appreciate them on their own terms. And uh, as a scholar, that's what I seek to do as well. Uh, not to impose my views on it, either positive or negative. I mean, it's impossible not to, I understand. There's a context and we receive it in that way and we either like or dislike the author. Although, as Lewis said, if you really dislike somebody, then don't be a critic because you're not going to give them a fair shake. Uh, so the best critics tend to be those that really love the thing that they're reading. Because they, they're, whatever is the virtue of it is the thing that they uh, sense and can speak to. So that's great. And um, I, I do think that that's a great pattern and a great model. So I'm happy to teach this course because I do love Lewis. I think he's, he's great. Uh, having said that, then I can see the deficiencies. And they're not born of personal animosity or antipathy to Lewis's whatever, his Irishness, his whatever, his evangelicalism, which he, of which he isn't one, by the way, um, any of those sorts of things. Uh, I, I just receive him, as I say, I came to Lewis uh, reading him as an undergraduate. The first book I read was The Allegory of Love, and I read him as a literary critic for years. Uh, and then only later, I didn't read Narnia as a child, and I didn't read the sci-fi novels until I was in my 30s. After I had a diet of science fiction my whole life and always had loved the genre, but hadn't read Lewis. And so um, I th I'm, I'm glad of that now. Although I would have enjoyed him as a, as a young man, I'm, I'm quite sure. But I, I appreciate him differently as, as an adult. Um, I just wanted to conclude a few thoughts on Out of the Silent Planet before we move on to Paralandra. Our speaker last night said that she thought it was his best book, and uh, I think that there's good reason. I mean, that's her personal preference, so I can't speak to that. But I think it is a very good book, and I don't want to waste uh, too much class time not talking about that. It's, uh, it deserves uh, the attention uh, we're going to give to it, namely two classes. Uh, I, I'm not sure it's his best book, but it is up there. For sure, for sure. Um, but let's conclude out of the silent planet because the, the thematic significance of this, they are meant a, to be a trilogy and they do um, uh, hold together quite importantly. And the concluding section in which Ransom is conversing with Oyarsa about the cosmos and about the characteristic deficiencies of the way Lewis's progressive uh, society views the world, the scientific elite, scientism, uh, the myth of progress, those sorts of things. These are getting their str some of their strongest critique at the end of this novel, and I didn't get to that, so let me, let me get to that here. And I want to pick it up. I, I referred last time to the silent planet, and we got something of the, uh, the account of uh, the fall you know, why is it called the silent planet? There used to be an Oyarsa here, and what was the effect of Satan's, uh, that is Lucifer's, rebellion against God? Well, it's that um, the creatures on earth had been left without an Oyarsa, and so as one of the uh, uh, creatures on uh, Malachandra says, so each one thinks that he is his own Oyarsa is the consequence of that. So everyone thinks that he is as a god, which is the promise the serpent makes to Eve. Eat of this fruit and you will be as gods, knowing both good and evil, right? Or determining good and evil for yourselves. That's a godlike attribute. You are going to determine it. Uh, so this is a bad effect. Everyone is like, uh, it states in the at the end of the book of Judges, um, does what is right in his own eyes. That's a terrible consequence. How do we, how does the modern scientific progressive state counter that? It, it's try to create a uniformity amongst people so that they behave in the same way. So there's a uniformity of occupation. There's a uniformity of everything, clothing down to not just uniforms, 
but even um, getting up at the same time, there's an attempt to make life conform to um, machines. So you got to be on time. You're late. Well, what do you mean I'm late? Well, it says on the clock there it is 9.52 and you're supposed to be here at 9.50 or something like You're late. So we have it down to the minute. <clears throat> so there's a conformity to a, a notion of time which we can all recognize. And that sort of um, universally recognized standard is now going to be enforced everywhere. The effect of this is that uh, human freedom is limited. And the rules that are put on humanity are no longer those of loving God and loving our neighbor, but of conformity to those who are in authority. And free speech is curtailed in the process, freedom of expression. And this is one of the great themes of uh, both Lewis and Tolkien's work, this, this curtailing of human freedom, which is unnatural. In fact, it's at war with nature. Certainly throughout all of them, that is a, a preeminent concern. They, they've seen it in the world around them. They're trying to further and promote the progress of life, but they're doing so, at, ironically, at the expense of uh, a meaningful life. One of the attempts is to extend life, make life, people live longer. But for Lewis and Tolkien, the question is not how do I live a longer life, but how do I live a better life? And their question, Lewis and Tolkien's, is the age-old philosophical question. What does it mean to live a good life? What's the purpose and meaning of life? When I, once I've determined that, then I will tell you whether I've lived a good life. Now, we've already seen how the um, Karasa understand their lives to be meaningful, and it is to have a child. They Again, the sexual union, they have sex one time. To have a child, and then they, so they're preparing for that, and then they talk about it ever after. So it's a meaningful event. And the only thing on par with it is the communal telling of it in songs and stories and poetry, which is a, a, a binding communal <laughs> ritual. And, and, and then hopefully they'll come across one of these hnakra, uh, these beasts that might kill them, or they might kill the beast. And if they do, then they can celebrate that in song. So these are meaningful events uh, in which uh, life is at stake, and they derive a communal uh, significance from that. And you compare that and you contrast it to Lewis and Tolkien's world, represented by Weston, wh who wants to make progress to advance human life, extend it everywhere. So humanity needs to put his, its foot on every planet for progress to take place. Well, how is that progress? Well, it hasn't been done before. Yes, there's no doubt about that. Nobody disputes that. But, but why is that progress? Like, what's the standard of progress there? Or to extend life and to live um, almost infinitely. Well, why is that progress? Because life is sacred. Well, then why are you willing to, let, to uh, sacrifice individuals for the purpose of extending this life? Like, is an individual worth that? Yes, for the sake of humanity. Well, humanity is now a collective entity to which individuals can be sacrificed for that goal without ever questioning what's the meaning and purpose of life. So it's a totally um, unphilosophical, unreflective idea of life and uh, Lewis and Tolkien are both very uh, keen in their criticism of it. So let me uh, read a section here. This is from page 136 from my edition, and that's page, uh, chapter 20. And I'll just read this one extract, and then we'll, I'll move on. And this is when Weston enters the state. So Ransom has been speaking to Ayarsa. And now Weston is going to speak for himself, in defense of himself, and he's going to try and he's going to speak down, not only to Ransom but to Oyarsa as well, because after all, he's made the progress of coming to this planet. Therefore, he ought to be telling Oyarsa what's what, and not vice versa. 
And this is what he says. Um, and actually, by the way, the translation of Weston's narrative by Ransom is almost hilarious. It, that, it's one of the funniest things. He said, so Weston says this, and then when he tries to translate it, he's, he's realizing that this doesn't sound right in another language. And so he's having to put it in terms, but the putting it into the terms is actually really getting to the gist of what he's saying, and it's crazy. So that's fascinating. And as I say, translation is this act of trying to put into another's language something comprehensible. Not always the easiest thing to do if the original language is saying crazy things. Now, underneath all of that uh, is this idea of natural law, human, the law of human nature. In this case, human nature will be extended to all creature, all now, as they call them. So all rational beings. That's Lewis's phrase. But so here, here's what it is. As soon as Ransom finished, Weston continued, life is greater than any system of morality. Her claims are absolute. It is not by tribal taboos and copybook maxims that she has pursued her relentless march from the amoeba to man and from man to civilization. He says, began Ransom, that living creatures are stronger than the question whether an act is bent or good. No, that cannot be right. He says it is better to be alive and bent than to be dead. Uh, no, he says, he says, I cannot say what he says, Oyarsa, in your language. But he goes on to say that the only good thing is that there sh should be very many creatures alive. He says that there were many other animals before the first men, and the later ones were better than the earlier ones. But he says that the animals were not born because of what is said to the young about bent and good action by their elders. And he says that these animals did not feel any pity. She began Weston. I'm, I'm sorry, interrupted Weston, but I've forgotten who she is. Life, of course snapped Weston. She has ruthlessly broken down all obstacles and liquidated all failures, and today in her highest form, civilized man, and in me as his representative. She presses forward to that interplanetary leap which will perhaps place her forever beyond the reach of death. She, life, and his life's representative, Weston, the ambassador, the representative of life, is escaping the earth and its conditions as if it were a prison house of death. So he has eternity in, in view. He says, resume Ransom, that these animals learned to do many difficult things except those who could not, those who are not capable or able. And those ones died, and the other one animals did not pity them because, of course, progress was happening. And progress uh, is not to be something that's to be pitied. It's a good thing. So love grows cold. And he says the best animal now is the kind of man who makes the big huts and carries the heavy weights and does all the other things I told you about. So those that have scientific, technological devices. Are we not superior to our parents? We've got the latest iPhones. We can use them in a way our parents are not able to. Does this not make you superior to them? The funny thing about this is actually amongst the young, and it, it's true of every generation, that are under this myth of progress, they actually think that the things that they have make them superior to their forebears. Not just having greater power, but having a moral superiority, because it allows them to escape moral questions. So that's part of the myth of, it's not just the myth of progress, it's the allure of it. There's an, a, 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 a divinization that takes place. So if you think about it, I can use my phone to talk to somebody on the other side of the world or even to see them <coughs> in virtual time, like no, with no interruption. Well, this is a godlike power. It's extraordinary, unprecedented. And there, so that, again, there's a, a a necessary imaginative aspect that comes along with that is that I really start to see myself as having no limits on my life. I can do anything. 
and that the technology is going to allow further advances. And are those further advances beneficial to me as a person? Well, they, like, they give me more power, so they must be good for me as a person. Right? So that's the allure of the power of technology. What it is at war with is your human nature. And uh, partly of that is the, the law of human nature. That is of good and evil, right and wrong. In fact, you have to get rid of that very idea in order to accept that progress is progressive. So that's the criticism here. Now in the end, Oyarsa comments on this and, and says that, um, uh, this is a two pages over, me care for man, he, said, he, he translates to Weston, and then Weston understands, me care for man, care for our race, what man begets, he had asked for ransom the words for race and beget. Strange, said Oyarsa, you do not love any one of your race. You would have let me kill Ransom. You do not love the mind of your race, nor the body. Any kind of creature will please you if only it is begotten by your kind as they now are. It seems to me, thick one, that what you really love is not no completed creature, but the very seed itself, for that is all that is left. This man is incapable, it's, he loves the, uh, the kernel or the seed of what may come. So, and that now an interesting language here. The seed of the woman is the seed of himself. Now this is obviously Lewis reflecting theologically, at least through the language, if not uh, explicitly, in terms of a new pattern of opposition to God's plan. Right, the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent, etc. Well, Weston and the scientists of their day don't uh, for the sake of humanity, love no individual person. They don't love, they don't even love themselves. They don't worship the mind. They don't worship the body. They don't, none of that. They worship the, uh, what might come in the future. That, a, a, a germ of an idea. And they're willing to wipe out everything for it, annihilate it all. I think this is quite profound. And then tell him, said Weston, when he had been made to understand this, that I don't pretend to be a metaphysician. I've not come here to chop logic. If he cannot understand, as apparently you can't either, anything so fundamental as a man's loyalty to humanity, I can't make him understand it. So I'll leave it off there. So the, uh, what we have now is the scientists spluttering and sputtering because the Boyarsa and by this point Ransom have come to realize the nature of the conflict here, which is between a, a nature that is created by God and bound by his moral law and whose very uh, created being is good with the supposed good of the transhumanist scientific community that think they can sacrifice anything, including humanity, for the sake of humanity. So they're going to promote life for the sake of life, but they don't actually, can't tell you what life is. We'll tell you when we've finished what it is. And they do awful things. We saw it back in Frankenstein. They were doing, doing awful things, and they're still willing to do awful things, but are deluded in thinking that they're doing it for the sake of humanity and for progress. It's an extraordinary uh, observation, I think. We'll see similar ones when we come to Tolkien, but let me come to Paralandra, which for me, uh, I'm not sure it's the best book, but it's close. The best book is Till We Have Faces, in my estimation. As a literary work, it's the best work. Yes? Uh, what is the name of the Earth? Thulkandra. Yeah. Thulk apparently means silent, and Andra is a planet. So Malak, Kandra, Para, Andra, and Thulk, Andra. Thulk is silent. So the silent planet, because there's no communication coming from that Earth with the other Oyarse. Because there's a in in that universe in which heaven is at the top and hell is at the bottom. Right? So it's not when you go up to heaven and you go into heaven, 
you can also go down to the bottom and earth is not the bottom of that whole cosmology hell is actually so what's in the earth at its center that's hell you go down to shale you or you move down to hell it's portrayed as being in within the earth so that's the because we have to think spatially right we're we're temporal creatures we have bodies that are limited so we think in terms of space and time and that is the imaginative framework hell is down there in the middle of the earth that's where it's located and heaven is up there but really where is it well heaven is not in a physical location like that. Right? God is everywhere. And it's heaven, it's, it, the, the kingdom of God is breaking in all around us. We can't see it except when the gospel is proclaimed and people live in accordance with the love of God. Then it's visible, it becomes manifest. So it's, but we, we have to think and we imagine only in physical terms and so therefore we think hell is down there and heaven's up there. Again, it's it's adaptation to our creaturely nature that we talk and think this way. Paralandra is a re, uh, a retelling of Paradise Lost by Milton on planet Venus. So it's Paradise Lost, or a variation on it within the context of science fiction. When I say it is paradise lost, the question is whether th this paradise will be lost. Remember, uh, Paralandra, that is planet Venus, is an unfallen world. It was not affected by the fall of Philcandra. So the fall of Philcandra hit Mars because it was beneath it. It, it did hit that world. Malacandra was going to die the consequence of that original rebellion. So Iarsa was maintaining it, but when it was going to die, it had not yet been subject to sin, and that's interesting. So death, yes, sin seemingly. If so, then it's certainly restrained by the Oyarsa of that world. So it's possible to conceive of these things, but then Oyarsa takes care of it. So sin is restrained. If it's, at, if it's even possible, but the world will die. And the Oyarsa of Malacandra suggests that um, this is not necessarily a bad thing. because, it, And again, questioning the progressive's idea that the meaning of life is just to live infinitely without any moral um, considerations, which is an extraordinary thing and is the way the world is being construed as we even speak by the... Uh, people in Silicon Valley. Yes? I find it interesting that you say that because I got a hint of Paradise Lost in, I don't know if that was Rondo, but in the conversation we had with Damien, when he was kind of... Um, in in Paralandra? Yes. Okay. Um, when he was speaking um, to himself, I guess, in his head or something, and he was trying to figure out the peace. Oh, yes. Add, yes. He said that he realized that it could be subject to being lost. Yes. And I thought of that for Paradise Lost. Yes. And you're right to do so. And, and uh, Lewis would have written, I believe, and I'm not, I should have checked this before I came, he wrote his preface to Paradise Lost rough, roughly at the same time that he's writing this, which would have been based on his hearing of lectures by Charles Williams, one of the other Inklings who was brilliant on the topic. Um, and so his mind was very much into the account of Paradise Lost uh, and Milton's account of that. And now he's taking it and saying, what are we going to do here on an unfallen world? What if? What if the world were unfallen? And the modern scientist were going to present, and the, and the allure of progress were presented to a woman like that. How would that be received by such a woman? And how would it differ from the account because that's the account, he, he's basically suggesting that Satan was the first humanitarian. And in fact, Milton, to some degree, presents him that way, as a benefactor to mankind. He stands up, offended on humanity's behalf that something has been withheld, namely the tree, the forbidden truth, oh, how dare he? And he know he wants to prevent you from tasting of it because then you'll become as gods. Did he not say you'd become as gods? 
Yes, well, he wants you to prevent you from doing that. So he wants something that's not good for you. He says it's good, but that's what he says. And look at me. I tasted of it, and I was a serpent before, and now I can speak. But So if you eat that, you will ascend the chain of being and become like a god. Is that not a good thing? Yes, of course. So she's deceived in this. Now it will be the modern scientist, that is Weston, who will come and take the role of tempter. Now what's interesting in this, I'll come to it in just a second, is that Weston is not only speaking as a scientist, Weston will give himself over to the power of the devil who will then, he willingly does so, and then the devil basically takes possession of him. And, and we need to realize that, that, that Lewis's novels are taking place in terms of the scientist, the, art, the artist, this debate. But there's another level at which uh, God is at work, and so is the devil. There are actually supernatural forces at work in, in the stories. And they are actually they're, uh, directing the events. Never the case in science fiction whether it's Mary Shelley or, or H.G. Wells, or many of the contemporary sci-fi like Star Trek and so forth, that God is Mary to be, nowhere to be seen. But here, essential to the plot, and so is supernatural evil in the form of the serpent. And is just able to use, remember our enemies are not flesh and blood, it says in Ephesians 6, the principalities and powers. Right, And so we're to put on the armor of God and pray and use the means that God gives us to fight against evil. So it, the enemy is not Weston. Weston is being used by those things. Now there can be, and again, Lewis and Tolkien are both reflecting on how the evil power of the devil in the world can use flesh and blood combatants. They can take the form of flesh and blood. They're not really what we oppose, but they are to some degree the, the cloak for what lies behind it. And they need to be fought as such. That's the thing here. So again, the question is, are Lewis and Tolkien pacifists? Absolutely not. They're not. Because, there's a, because we're bodily beings, spiritual warfare includes the body because we're not just spiritual beings. We don't just have spiritual fights, we have physical fights. So it needs to be physically resisted as well, while being mindful at the same time that it's not only a physical fight. If you accept it's only a physical fight, then you've already accepted the materialism of your opponents and you're done. But don't super spiritualize it and think that there is no phys physical fight to be had. That's consistent in all of Lewis's books, by the way. So I just listened to the end of The Silver Chair with my daughter in the car. And at the end of that, it begins with bullying in the playground. They go confront the white witch and hack her down with their swords. They chop off the, her head, she becomes a serpent. And then they, at the end of it all, they go back. Aslan blows them back into planet Earth and tells them to use the flats of their blades, the boys, and tells uh, Lucy to take a switch that is a a long piece of grab and usually there's a whip on the bullies so the physical you're going to punish them physically for what they did now don't take their life you're not there to kill them because they're just kids after all but they ought to be punished for their bad deeds so he has a, a beef with progressive education that will never lay a hand on anyone we're just going to get them to do what we want without physical means well then we're going to have to use other means to coerce how do you coerce people if you can't use physical means? Behavioral techniques or chemical. Very popular now. Little Ritalin for you. Works very well. It's like a shackle on your mind. It will change you. Um, is this really humanitarian? It might be. There, but it's certainly questionable. You know this yourselves, the, the widespread use of chemical means of, of uh, getting people to behave. Is this really humane? Lewis, Lewis 
cares what I say? Lewis questions it very strongly. And they're not even using physical me or, or chemicals. He, he would certainly find it. At, it's like a grand experiment on the populace. Let's see if we can control this through a, uh, a means that the scientists have at their disposal to get people to do what we want, and it becomes like a brave new world then. So to Paralandra, uh, with the, all of that in mind, uh, it, it begins rather differently, and it, it's uh, the narrator at the beginning of chapter one, the as I left the railway station at Worcester, that's how it's pronounced by the way, not Worcester, Worcester. You would never guess it, so I, I'm just telling you, it's, it's Worcester. Don't ask me to explain it, it just is. And it's Leicester, it's not Leicester. It's just, it's Leicester and it's Worcester. Just take it, <laughs> accept it. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. Although I could mess with you and say you were. <laughs> just take it on authority. Yeah. <laughs> but it's Worcester. Uh, I, I left the railway train at uh, Worcester and set out on a three-mile walk to Ransom's cottage. I reflected that no one on that platform could possibly guess the truth about the man I was going to visit. Now, who is this man? Well, this man is Ransom, and, but who's the I then? We have a new narrator. It's not Ransom telling the story. Who, who is the person telling the story here at the outset? Ransom had met other things in Mars besides the Martians. He had met the creatures called Eldila, and especially the great Eldil, who was the ruler of Mars, or in their speech, the Oyarsa of Malacandra. The Eldil are very different from any planetary creatures. Their physical organism, if organism it can be called, is quite unlike either the human or the Martian. They do not eat, breed, breathe, or suffer natural death, and to that extent resemble thinking minerals more than they resemble anything we would recognize as an animal, a thinking mineral. Rather than an animal, if we're just thinking in terrestrial terms. Though they appear on planets and may even seem to our senses to be something sometimes resident in them, the precise spatial location of an Aldil at any moment presents great problems. They themselves regard space or deep heaven as their true habitat and the planets are to them not closed worlds but merely moving points, perhaps even interruptions in what we know as the solar system and they as the field of our bowl. <clears throat> so he is questioning the whole uh, material and mat uh, worldview of his contemporaries. Space is not emptiness and material is not the most uh, substantial. The physical is not the most substantial important element. This is, a, this is a blow not only at the science of his day, it's at empiricism. <clears throat> <He's> a, <clears throat> and with it, the scientific method by which we determine thing, whether something is a fact and therefore true. and the human sciences that are based on determining <coughs> facts are never going to touch human nature in its essence. Because human nature is not simply the flesh and blood physical thing. It will include a spiritual element. And that spiritual element is not something you can empirically verify to the point where everyone's going to say, oh, it is so. It has the precept, but he, so he's making plausible, and, and I think he makes it plausible not just imaginatively, but he's giving a rational case for Christian belief, but not Christian per se, although it is Christian in his case, but simply a belief in, the, in miracles and the supernatural on the basis of natural law. That's what he's demonstrating here. Far more plausible, far more rational, and far more attractive than the scientific atheism of his day. So, but he begins right with that. So he's establishing what these Aldala are and how they operate and where they operate. Now he needs to do that because this story is going to begin 
with the visit of the, the Aldila, and so there's a super, now we are acknowledging, at first we only saw uh, people that were the actors in the, the play. So stage one, out of the Silent Planet, most of the agents are human agents. Now we've moved to supernatural agents as being in the forefront of the story. Now that we've introduced them as plausible actors, they are driving the narrative. If he'd begun his trilogy that way, it would have seemed implausible. Now it seems necessary. And there's hope that comes with that. If there's supernatural agency, and God then is involved in this, there's also a sense, if God is good, that there's going to be a good outcome to all of the terrible events, or being orchestrated. There's a providence at work. But he will plod along empty, on the empty, unfenced road which runs across the middle of Worcester Common. I tried to dispel my, my growing sense of malaise by analyzing it. What, after all, was I afraid of? The moment I put this question, I regretted it. I was shocked to find that I had mentally used the word afraid. Up till then, I had tried to pretend that I was feeling only distaste or embarrassment or even boredom. But the mere word afraid had let the cat out of the bag. I realize now that my emotion was neither more nor less nor other than Year. And the modern scientist wants to get rid of, social scientist wants to get rid of such concepts because they, there's something outside of ourselves that has power over us. We want to get rid of that idea. It, Freud wants to get rid of the notion of guilt. That's a, a social construct that's been foisted upon us. It's not a real thing. Right? Because guilt is the consequence of an awareness of moral good and moral evil. And, and the feeling of, I've done something wrong. He says this is delusional, so we'll get rid of those ideas. We'll get rid of fear. We'll get rid of any sense of a power above us to which we are accountable. The moral law, we've got to get rid of that. We'll bring it wholly under human control. We'll get rid of the concept of guilt. We'll not speak of sin. will not speak of good in absolute terms. There'll be relative good. There will be helpful, encouraging, but not good. Because the as soon as we introduce good, then we have to introduce its opposite, which is bad. And now we're appealing to things that are uh, not determined by people absolutely. And they've got to get rid of all that language. And this is part of political correctness, is getting rid of terms that will suggest that there is a creaturely uh, imprint of God's work on human nature to which we are bound. We've got to get rid of that. That's the, that's the real thrust of political correctness, by the way. Mm. It's to get rid of the idea that God has determined who we are and we are thereby accountable to him. You've got to get rid of that idea. And how is that expressed in male and female nature? That's a man, that's a woman, they're different. A repugnant idea that there's a creaturely distinction and we are not the authors of, of ourselves. We're not uh, self-authoring. We're not orphans that determine our nature. So he realizes this thing and know that this is the I who's speaking. He realized that it's fear. He doesn't like that thought because that introduces all sorts of other uncomfortable thoughts outside of himself. So up till then, he had been trying to pretend I was feeling only distaste or embarrassment or even boredom, but the mere word afraid had let the cat out of the bag. I guess we'll have to get rid of the word afraid going forward. But now he realizes it is fear, and I realized that I was afraid of two things. Afraid that sooner or later I myself might meet an Elvil, something that he cannot account for or God and afraid that I might get drawn in furthermore. He wants to avoid any encounter that will force him to do something other than to deny that God exists. 
He wants to avoid that. There's intense distaste at the very idea that he might have to consider that as applying to himself. So don't talk to me about God. There's a re- not just a, a rejection intellectually, there's a, almost a physical repugnance because there's an awareness, if that's true, then I am subject to the categories of good and evil and sin and righteousness and so forth. And I'm, so I, I, it's a repugnance. If your experience is mine with, uh, in presenting Christianity, and I, I do uh, do that, uh, the objection that most people have, they'll give you 100 intellectual objections, uh, by the way. At least some people will. But what it comes down to is that they don't, uh, it, it tends to be a moral issue. That's, that's the real objection. It comes out after you argue with them for an extended period. If that's true, then, you know, either my sexual habits or somebody else's are going to come into question. That would be the implication of what you're saying, and I don't want to consider that. I, I find that a repugnant idea, that there are moral considerations. It's almost always sexual in our day and age. Perhaps it always was, but certainly in our day. So when I became a Christian, that was the thing that really troubled me. I must say, in my late 20s. If this is true, the Christian sexual ethic that I read about in the New Testament is still valid today. And then a thousand objections go to my head, through my head. But I don't live in an agrarian village now. I live in, I'm in Durham. I mean, I'm on, and there's a, like, and I'm an adult. I'm in my late 20s. Like, are we really supposed to live that sexual ethic out in our day and age, 2,000 years on, different context conditions of life and I thought this is a repugnant idea this is impossible but at the end of the day I thought there is no there is no other possibility here I just don't like it Hmm. at all until you start thinking about it and think well actually had that been the case that person I knew back then wouldn't have been hurt and I wouldn't have been hurt and this person would have been and these consequences would have okay so the difficulty of living that life is no argument against whether it ought to be the case. And if it ought to be the case, and God commands it, it's also possible, and there may be blessings that come with obeying it that I could not have conceived had I not tried to do it. And that, that was the point. And I just, I say I wrestled with this for months as a, as a young Christian, and, and people will have to wrestle with that today. I recognize that. That's why I'm saying it. it's on tape. There you go. It's, it's just, this is real, real stuff. And so that's what he, he's afraid he's going to get drawn in. That's the fear. I don't want to go to church with you. Why? Like, what's it going to hurt you? You're just going to hear somebody speaking. Yeah, but I might get drawn in. That's what they're thinking. Yeah, I, I and that, they're afraid of it. It's not that, like, I'm a friendly person. You come along with me. We're friends. Yeah, do you want to come with me to church? Uh, no. Why? You don't believe in any of that mumbo jumbo. You know, don't. You can't persuade me. Well, then what's the problem? That's that's it. Might get drawn in. In other words, might encounter something that would force them just by the sheer truth of it to repent. And that would mean that if Jesus is Lord, I'm not Lord. Because it can't be both. So they recognize immediately that it's a lordship issue. And if it's a lordship issue, then I'm no longer my own. I belong body and soul to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And that means that he will determine the rest of my life. I have to answer to him. And I, I know all the consequences. And I, so I'm, get, I'm avoiding that whole situation. Because as soon as I get there, I can't say I didn't know. But at the moment, I can't. So I'm, I'm just, it's avoidance. And then there are people like me, like uh, many adult converts that I know who will have been dragged through life and by God to the point where we're going to uh, repent and say enough. So there you go. But so, you will be drawn at the moment at which a man realizes that what had seemed mere speculations are on the point of landing him in the communist party or the Christian church. 
the sense that a door is just slammed and left him on the inside. Oh, shh. That was my replacement for a swear word. I was <laughs> You know, I'm in. I can't go back out without knowing what I've done, and so I would rather avoid that situation. Thank you. The thing was such sheer bad luck. Ransom himself had been taken to Mars, or Malachandra, against his will, and almost by accident. And I had become connected with his affair by another accident. Note that he calls them accidents. Of course he does. He's not a believer. They're accidents. It just happened. But if God is and exists, there are no accidents. Yet here, we were both getting more and more involved in what I could only describe as interplanetary politics. That's his description. As to my intense wish never to come into contact with the elder and myself, I'm not sure whether I can even make you understand it. It is something more than a prudent desire to avoid creatures alien in kind, very powerful and very intelligent. The truth was that all I heard about them served to connect two things which one's mind tends to keep separate. And that connecting gave one a sort of shock. And what, I, what is this? We tend to think about non-human intelligences in two distinct categories, which we label scientific on the one hand and supernatural on the other. We think in one mood of Mr. Wells, Martians. So he's still commenting on, on uh, that novel, right? We tend to think of Mr. Wells, Martians, very unlike the real Malachandrians, by the by, or his Selenites in quite a different mood. We let our minds loose on the possibility of angels, ghosts, fairies, and the like. But the very moment we are compelled to recognize a creature in either class as real, the distinction begins to get blurred. And whether it is a creature like an Eldil, the distinction vanishes altogether. These things were not animals. To that extent, one had to classify them within the second group. But they had some kind of material vehicle whose presence could, in principle, be scientifically verified. Just like the, the existence of angels. To that extent, they belonged to the first group. The distinction between natural and supernatural, in fact, broke down. And when it had done so, one realized how great a comfort it had been how it had eased the burden of intolerable strangeness which this universe imposes on us by dividing it into two halves and encouraging the mind never to think of both in the same instant. And yet, that is the case. But if it is the case, then it's not within our control, and that's the issue. Again, it's a lordship issue. If the supernatural exists alongside and connected to, like we have a soul, an immaterial aspect to us, which the scientists can't recognize, and yet we recognize because of the, of the moral law within us. We govern ourselves by it. We appeal to it whenever we say to my brother or sister, that's not fair. We appeal to a sense of fairness that we all recognize intuitively. We're all, uh, we're all acting in that universe, but we, we have to keep them separate. But we can't. And that drives us crazy. Because then you have to consider that we are not actually in control of everything. It pushes us back to account for God's sovereign involvement in all of life. A thought we do not welcome until we repent. Even if it is good for us, even when we're not repenting. God loves those who are sinners, by the way. Which is why he calls them to repent. He doesn't want them to perish. And they're hell-bent on perishing. This is a long and dreary road, I thought to myself. Thank goodness I haven't anything to carry. And then with the start of realization, I remembered that I ought to be carrying a pack containing my things for the night. I swore to myself I must have left the thing to the train. Who is this person? What's his name? Lewis. So Lewis goes and meets Ransom. Remember, Ransom, uh, I said to you, evident from his letters, is, is modeled after Tolkien. So Lewis and Tolkien are having a little dialogue here. And Lewis, at this point, envisages himself in, the, in Paralandra, not as he is, but as a fictional character who's not a Christian. 
right? The pre-Christian Lewis is now encountering Tolkien, who is one, mm -hmm. and is bringing him to, into the faith, right? That's, that's Lewis's own narrative, his biographical account of his life. So he's, he's picturing himself in his mind's eye with his author's pen as the uh, pre-converted Lewis and what he felt like and thought like and wanted to keep separate. He was terrified at this prospect. And then he does come in and he meets the Eldala. Now I will skip over this to some degree and he sees a set white and semi-transparent thing somewhat like ice but it's more like a coffin and he has to help his friend Westing get into it. Now, this is among his, his best writing, I think. It, it's the psychological and spiritual awareness of the non-believer, which he knows very well from both sides of the coin, what he thought and felt like, and he's able to describe it in the presence of God. So it's, it's the fact that he was an adult convert that allows him to see it from both sides and present it. And I think it, he does it so plausibly and well then. But he says, uh, this is page 19, so it's in, uh, towards the end of chapter 1, right towards the end, two pages from the end. I had no doubt at all that I was seeing an Eldil, this says Lewis, the character, and little doubt that I was seeing the Archon of Mars, the Oyarsa of Malacandra. And now that the thing had happened, I was no longer in a condition of abject panic. My sensations were, it is true, in some ways very unpleasant. The fact that it was quite obviously not organic. The knowledge that intelligence was somehow located in the, this homogeneous cylinder of light, but not related to it as our consciousness is related to our brains and nerves was profoundly disturbing. So it's not what a psychologist could identify. It's something other than that it would not fit into our categories. The fact that he doesn't like either. If I can't categorize it, then I can't understand it and I can't master it. The response which we ordinarily make to a living creature and that which we make to an, an, an inanimate object were here both equally inappropriate. On the other hand, all of those doubts which I had felt before I entered the cottage as to whether the creatures were friend or foe and whether Ransom was a pioneer or a dupe had for the moment vanished. My fear was now of another kind. I felt sure that the creature was what we called good. But I wasn't sure whether I liked goodness as much as I had supposed. This is a very terrible experience. Because goodness is holiness, and he recognizes he's a sinner. And so he recognizes a hostility towards him from goodness. That was my interpolation back to the text. As long as what you are afraid of is something evil, you may still hope that the good may come to your rescue. But suppose you struggle through to the good and find that it is also dreadful. How if food itself turns out to be the very thing you can't eat, and home the very place you can't live, and your very comforter the person who makes you uncomfortable? Then, indeed, there is no rescue possible. The last card has been played. For a second or two, I was nearly in that condition. Here at last was a bit of that world from beyond the world which I had always supposed that I loved and desires breaking through and appearing to my senses, and I didn't like it. I wanted it to go away. It's the experience of God's holiness. And here we have a holy being in his presence who is certainly good, and yet there's an implacable hostility he experiences which is, is its genuine hostility to him, but more than anything, it's his hostility to it. And one of them has to relent. And since the one's good, it, it's not the good guy who's gonna have to relent, it's him. So wonderful depiction. And, and, and useful because the reader 
who is reading this is an audience that, it, I mean, he doesn't know who his audience is. He may have Christians in the audience, but even when Christians, they benefit from this understanding of human nature, our sinful human nature in the presence of holiness. But for a non-Christian audience, he's explaining the categories of spiritual perception and experience that they will really never have considered. So again, it's a theological presentation of the theater of science fiction in a, I think, entirely plausible way and appealing at that. So off he goes, and there's a conversation between uh, uh, Ransom and Lewis, but I'm just going to skip over that. And he is simply for the sake of time. And we're going to go in this celestial coffin. And he is going to go to another planet. He's being sent there, in fact. Now he knows who is sending him. The last time, at first, he was unaware. Later on, he became aware. But now it's explicit. So he is, in terms of his development as a character, Ransom is, is, is drawing closer to Mal Eldil. He's now aware that he is working within his will, which means that he has to he recognizes that he has a will himself, and he must will Maleldil's will. That means that he can also step outside of Maleldil's will, and he can disobey. So hit the, the, the situation that confronts the Green Lady is the same as Fort Ransom. They both can follow God and do what is right, or they can disagree. Now, the difference between them is one is a fallen, forgiven sinner, and the other has never sinned before. And the one who's never sinned before can't even imagine. She has to be forced to imagine, in fact, why she would want to sin. And they're like, what a stupid thing. And Ransom is going to stand there, and he is going to face a different scenario than was ever presented in Milton's Paradise Lost. He is going to try and have to prevent the fall from happening. He tries it through arguments. In the end, that's not going to work for him. Because his opponent is uh, his intellectual superior in one sense, although he is not in another sense because uh, Ransom has all the best arguments because he's got truth on his side. So it, his opponent may be supernatural, may have existed long before he ever did, in fact saw Christ himself crucified, have great power beyond his ability, and yet the truth does not conform to his dictates. So he can be bested in argument. Whether he can be bested in other ways is a different matter. He doesn't have to sleep, remember. Ransom does. So the physical, now here's a reflection. I'll, I'll come to that in, uh, in a second and certainly next class. He confronts it, and at the end of the day, it's a physical assault as well as a spiritual assault. And the physical assault is connected to the spiritual assault, just like the world wars were. It was physical combat, and it was not separated from the spiritual combat. They, were, they came together as one. They weren't the same. They had to be distinguished. Otherwise, you would think the Germans were demons. The Germans are not demons. In fact, the English are as demonic as the, as the Germans are in their capacity for moral evil. That doesn't mean that their, their cause was just or that the Germans didn't need to be defeated. They did need to be defeated because they promoted this idea of the Aryan race, which would mean that everyone who was not of that site, of that sort, was going to be exterminated. They needed to fight. But it was, a, it was an idea at, and a, a spiritual uh, thing that needed to be fought in a physical form. But the physical needed to be fought. And that's what we're going to find in Paralandra is uh, Ransom comes to the conclusion he can't believe it. Here we have J.R.R. Tolkien naked on planet Venus having to fight in physical combat against another man. And he's not ready for that. He's fat and middle-aged. Can't believe he's got to fight in the trenches, as it were, just like Tolkien would have had to have done it as a young man. He's an intellectual. He wants to spend his life in books. 
And now he's got to have, do physical hand-to-hand -hand combat, nothing else, in order to obey God's will? Surely not. Why would God command people who are not physically superb specimens to do this? Why him? Questions he will ask. And he won't get an answer. Which is interesting. The reader will apply this to his or her life. Why is God asking me to do this? Surely God could have used somebody better than I. Less vulnerable. More financially stable. More whatever. Ready for the, more ready for the fight of the sort. Or I would rather fight on this ground than not that ground. Why do I have to fight on this ground? Well, because that's the fight that he's given you to fight. That's why. I don't like that answer one bit. I do not like that answer. He's ready for this a spiritual battle, the battle of ideas. I like that one myself. I'll, I'll take that one every day. I'm prepared for that one. But a physical fight? Maybe 30 years ago. But even then, I mean, I'm not, I'm not six foot. I'm not, I mean, there are people bigger, stronger, whatever than me. I don't, no. But that's going to come. And so that's an aspect of it as well. So his, the spiritual fight is also a physical fight. That one's really hard for him to get his head around. That's Lewis, the... Uh, combat veteran reflecting on the present day experience. Sometimes spiritual evil has a physical form and needs to be fought physically. So he's not a pacifist. As critical as he is of the modern nation state and the, the evil that is pushed through it and the myth of progress, which they all seem to represent, he still can't wholly uh, divest himself of his culture. So it's terrible. Like, I don't support any of this stuff. I'd rather not be in the trenches with a gun in my hand. I'd rather have a sword and have a, a physical enemy in front of me instead of being a, cowering in a, you know, a trench and having bombs blow people apart all around me. I, who wants to fight that fight? No one. There's no glory in that. Anyway, uh, he goes, does ransom to Paralander. He raises himself on an elbow. And there's a lizard-like creature the size of a St. Bernard dog with a serrated back. Its eyes were open. This is now Ransom telling the tale. Pres presently, he ventured to rise on one elbow. When I say that, actually, it's the third-person narrator. Ransom is a character in it. Is it Lewis telling the story, then? I think so. So now Lewis is narrating. Having divested himself of his... Uh, intellectual and moral hostility to what the story was has come to believe that it must be so and now he's telling the story that Ransom had told him. So presently he, that is Ransom, ventured to rise on one elbow. The creature went on looking at him. He noticed that the island was perfectly level. He sat up and saw between the stems of the trees that they were in calm water. The sea looked like a gilded glass. He resumed his study of the dragon could this be a rational animal, a hnau, as they said in Malacandra? And the very thing he had been sent there to meet. By the way, hnau in Christian theology will include uh, human beings, angels, and God. Although God, it's a creature, so it's not God. But angels and human beings will be hnau, rational animals. Or ha rational beings of, of some sort, at any rate. Subject to the moral law. God himself will be subject to the moral law, although he's not now. Subject in a different sense, but here are the confines, the contours of his character. Of course it reflects him. Stranger, he said, I've been sent to your world through, through the heaven by the servants of Malaldil. Do you give me welcome? The thing looked at him very hard and perhaps very wisely. Then for the first time it shut its eyes. This seemed an unpromising start. Ransom decided to rise to its feet. The dragon reopened its eyes. It looked at him. It 
When it had drunk, it raised its head and gave a kind of croaking bleat that was not entirely unmusical. Then it turned, looked yet again at Ransom, and finally approached him. It's madness to wait for it, said the false reason, and Ransom, but Ransom set it his teeth. It said, said the false reason, it's madness. Now here we're going to find in Ransom for the first time, but we'll see hereafter, there are two voices in his head. One who is counseling him to do one thing and another to do something else. And he's going to have that, and that, that tension between those two voices is going to intensify. And he will have to assent to one or the other. And the strongest voice is not the voice that he ought necessarily to obey. Lewis will talk about this in Mere Christianity. The thing you ought to do may be the, the last thing you want to do. I don't want to jump into the lobby to save the drowning child. I ought to do it. The child's drowning. Yeah, but maybe I'll drown myself in the process. I don't want to do that. It's not my child. I'll pretend I didn't see it. Now I feel... What a terrible thing. Can you live with that? No. So you're going to go back and do it, even though you don't want to do it. Right? There's somebody that comes. Right? So that sense, so that those voices, which are a reflection of the internal dialogue we have in the face of the moral law, he will find here. So it's, it's madness to wait for it, said the false reason. Note that it's not no reason. There is a, a rationale to the voice. It's, it's madness. Of course it is. It's a dragon. He's got no clothes on. It's coming up to him. What if it opens its mouth? This is, <laughs> right? Oh, don't like that. It came right up and began nudging him with his cold snout about his knees. He was in great perplexity. Was it rational? And was this how it talked? Was it irrational but friendly? And if so, how should he respond? You could hardly stroke a creature with scales, or was it merely scratching itself against him? At that moment, with a suddenness which convinced him it was only a beast, it seemed to forget all about him, turned away, and began tearing up the herbage with great avidity, feeling that honor was now satisfied. He also turned away back to the woods. Now, the false reason says it's madness to wait. The right reason is I need to be courageous. There's a moral threat here, a physical threat, and I ought to be courageous in the face of it. And he does the right thing. This is the, his first sentiment, to be courageous, not an unimportant one, as it turns out. Then he sees the green lady for the first time. She's on another island. And the islands are not rooted uh, in the ground. They seem to float on the water, and the water's dirt. So she, he sees her when she's up here, sees her, and then she goes down, and, and then she disappears from sight. And I'll pick up the description here. With, with Beating heart, 52, Ransom waited till it was in view again. This time it was not between him and the sky. For a second or so, the human figure <clears throat> was undiscoverable. A stab of something like despair pierced him. Then he picked it out again, a tiny, darker shape moving slowly between him and a patch of blue vegetation. He waved and gesticulated and shouted till his throat was hoarse, but it took no notice of him. Every now and then he lost sight of it. Even when he found it again, he sometimes doubted whether it were not an optical illusion, some chance figuration of foliage, which his intense desire had assimilated to the shape of a man. But always, just before he had despaired, it would become unmistakable again. Then his eyes began to grow tired, and he knew that the longer he looked, the less he would see. But he went on looking nonetheless. There was a human form. There was another person in the world. He wasn't alone. That sense of loneliness which he had on Malacandra, he has it, he experiences again on Paralandra. And, and the, being deprived of the presence of another person, he experiences something like despair. So personal, physical, a, a person is essential to his human humanity, really. He needs another person. We need other people, but they, we need other people in part because they represent the divine person. But in a physical form, we, have, we need a physical person, not a virtual one, through FaceTime or whatever. But he sees and cries out, and eventually he comes to the green lady. And what does the green lady do when she finally comes to him? Because she's got all sorts of creatures around her. 
There are bubble trees, there are uh, tiny frog-like beasts, and they're leaping around, sometimes higher than her head. Ransom determined to speak using the old solar tongue, which he learned on Malacandra. I am from another world. He began and then stopped. The green lady had done something for which he was quite unprepared. She raised her arm and pointed at him, not as in menace, but as though inviting the other creatures to behold him. At the same moment, her face changed again, and for a second he thought she was going to cry. Instead, she burst into laughter. Peel upon peel of laughter till her whole body shook with it, till she bent almost double, and her hands resting on her knees, still laughing and repeatedly pointing at him. The animals, like our own dogs in similar circumstances, dimly understood that there was merriment afoot. All manner of gambling, wing clapping, snorting, and standing upon hind legs began to be displayed. And still the green lady laughed till yet again the wave divided them and she was out of sight. Ransom was thunderstruck. Had the Eldila sent him to meet an idiot? <laughs> or an evil spirit that mocked men? I'll leave it off with that. We'll pick it up next time. <laughs> but we have naked Mr. Ransom on <laughs> Venus being laughed at by a woman. He is not a happy camper. 